the South Africans world champion in the 50 meters breaststroke, a chap called Cameron Vandenberg, he said to me he could not have set the world record without this diet. He said, why? Because he had such gut distress, because he's got mild celiac disease, that as soon as he cut the grains, he was able to train much harder as a consequence. So it wasn't the glycogen necessary for the exercise, and it's an explosive event. He didn't worry about that. It was being able to train hard each day, and it's a point we forget. Three, immune function and injury risk. And that's a huge, huge factor that is going to come out in the future. And I think Steve's group is, again, emphasizing that we don't know what the effects of this diet is on immune function, but it's likely to be beneficial. And hand-eye coordination or capacity to concentrate in sports like golf and cricket. And I have absolutely no doubt that your performance in those sports will be much improved if you stop getting these glucose insulin spikes. And I'll show you uh, some, a couple of examples. So it's clearly, clearly premature to conclude that all athletes in all sports must be eating high carbohydrate diets. But now let's get on to the next question, and that's the long-term negative health consequences of high carbohydrate diets in persons with insulin resistance. And that's never really been focused on. And I'm a classic example, and I would suggest to you that Sir Stephen Redgrave is another example, a guy who wins five Olympic gold medals and gets type 2 diabetes. And you have to ask, how can you be such the world's greatest rower of all time and you get type 2 diabetes? Was it because he wasn't exercising? <laughs> <laughs> so I would guess he's insulin resistant, I'd guess he's got a family history like I do and the high carbohydrate diet. So you've seen this slide from both myself and Steve and uh, so my point is that if you're out here you can eat all those carbs, you'll be fine, but if you're down here you're going to pay a price. So you might have, to have performance but you're going to pay a price in the long term. And so I'm going to finish up now with some, some of my... Here's Bruce Fordyce, who's won nine Comrades Marathons and is considered the great athlete in South Africa. But 20 years later, he doesn't look so great. This guy's got the metabolic syndrome, and he doesn't mind me mentioning he's a great friend of mine. And he's been rude about me. He said, Tim, you've got a great brain, but you've got a bronze medal body. So, he's, I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> so here he is. He's obese. Uh, he's, his legs are awful and he's got the humpback, et cetera, et cetera, and his running is awful, and he hates his running. He goes on the diet, and that's what he looks like now. He's now running 18 minutes for 5Ks at altitude in South Africa at the age of 56. And he dropped his times in the race he was, had won from, by two hours. He's not anywhere near what he used to run, but the change has been utterly dramatic. And he says thank you every day for this diet, because it re recovered his running beautifully. Here's a sort of miracle example. This guy is uh, not a well-known South African runner, but he's a typical South African runner. He was really good as a high school runner. He gets progressively fatter and heavier, and he's running a, a 56K race. He's still got 30Ks to run, and he's got the survival shuffle. His feet are hardly moving. <laughs> <laughs> and here he finishes the race in 6 hours 57. That's one minute or two minutes short of the cutoff. And he's just about last position, 7,668. So he comes and speaks to me and I said, you know, Simon, you've got, you're metabolic, you're in, insulin resistant, you've got to cut the carbs. He says, I can't cut the carbs. I need it for my energy when I'm running. How can I? <laughs> so eventually he says, and he says, I'm going to have to cut beer. So I said, yes, for 100 days. <laughs> so he says, okay, for 100 days I can cope. And so he cuts for 100 days and he, loses, he starts to lose weight and he can run more and more and more and more and trains harder and harder and harder. So the next picture is one year later. And you might guess if a guy runs 6 hours 57 for a 56 kilometer race, what's he going to do a year later? Well, this is a year later and he cut his time by three hours. <laughs> cut it by three hours. <laughs> and he's in 207,400 positions. He is now winning races in South Africa at the age of 37. Astonishing. So what's the point? The point is that it was the insulin resistance and the high carbohydrate diet that was holding him back. So my prediction is if we actually looked at the real world population, runners like him, and we put them on a high fat diet, we would have such effects on performance that you, you wouldn't even begin to, to notice. So now let's go to another group of insulin-resistant athletes. <laughs> <laughs> so 
I know you've probably seen serial killers and you've heard Peter speak. And uh, I'm very proud. This is my favorite cricket team. And from a South African. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I'll... <laughs> so, so, so anyway, it was because of me that they changed their diet. And, <laughs> and Peter Bruckner will tell you how it happened. But anyway, we got four of your guys to change their diets. And in two test matches, three of these guys each caused, caused a century, scored a century in so those games. And this, this occurred, of course, between the Ashes tours. So the Ashes in England was a disaster. They converted their diet. And then, of course, when the Ashes were played here, there was a 5-0 whitewash. And, uh, and these guys were amazing. So, so when they were in Cape Town recently, they said, we must have the real meal revolution. So I went to them and I signed about 10 of the books for their family. And it was just a wonderful old Mitch Johnson, who that day had destroyed our cricket team. <laughs> <laughs> was the most gentlemanly guy I've ever met in my life. <laughs> and you, you, it was, he's completely different than what you see on the field. So anyway, and there's David Warner. And you know, I didn't know David when he was 25 years ago or so, but I can't he was pretty chubby. But here he is scoring 100, and there's no evidence for metabolic syndrome in this man. You know, he's looking amazing. And what do you say on serial killers? I've increased my energy to help my recovery. I'm not out of breath when I run between wickets when batting in cricket, which is astonishing. So here's a guy on a low carb diet who now finds he's got more energy. And, and then this is my particular favorite, Shane Watson, who's just the most wonderful, wonderful gentleman. If you, if you want a quality person, this is the guy. And uh, he, he said he was unable to control his weight using conventional dietary methods. He said, I'd always struggled to control my weight. I had to starve at the start of the season. And he said, but by the end of the season, I, I'd broken down and I just put on the weight again. And he said, I was convinced I was going to be fat all my life. Yeah. And what's he got? Exactly as me. His father's got type 2 diabetes. And he said, weight control is effortless on a high fat diet. And he starts with eggs and so on every day. So, so why is Shane Warne so happy? Well, Shane, Watson, Shane, Warne, Shane Watson. <laughs> I get it too mixed up. <laughs> Oops, oops, oops. <laughs> yeah, Shane Warne was a fabulous cricketer. Jeez, what a cricketer, but we used to hate him. <laughs> so why is he so happy? Because now he can control his weight. You see, that's what he's saying. <laughs> so, so the story is, this is what I believe now. I think instant sensitive athletes actually do have an advantage, and I think they're selected. So the world's best athletes probably have to be instant sensitive, and you probably do have to eat a high carbohydrate diet to produce explosive activity, let's say lasting 30 minutes. Up to 30 minutes, probably carbohydrates do help you, and the more you can burn, probably the better. So I don't contest that there's a population that will do very well on a high carbohydrate diet. But insulin-resistant athletes with or without type 2 diabetes are unable adequately to suppress hepatic glucose production causing hyperglycemia. We discussed that before in the earlier talk. And they then convert the excess carbohydrate to triglycerides, producing an unfavorable metabolic state. And that is apparent because they can't control their weight. And then we have to understand what effect is this having on their performance. And I suspect from what I've shown you that there's a big effect on their performance. But they do have the capacity to adapt to high-fat diets without any impairment in exercise performance. And I would argue the more insulin resistant you are, the better you will adapt to, to and the more benefits you will get. And, oh sorry, this was for another population, but your exercising diabetic patients or any of your insulin resistant patients will benefit from carbohydrate restriction and fat adaptation. Thank you very much for your attention. If you like this video, please subscribe and share this video on social media, and consider donating to my Ko-Fi account.